What's going on everyone? My name is Nicholas Merton here at Datadash and today is May 10th of 2018. Well folks, today I want to spend some time on a video that I think is not only really important but is really going to uh, take a, a second to step back from all the noise in the cryptocurrency and blockchain space and spend some time talking about perspective because I think it's very easy with how much is going on in regards to blockchain and new projects emerging and ICOs that a lot of people get really caught up in the noise of the here and the now rather than uh, looking forward and really seeing the potential of what we have in front of us. and. Again, I know uh, I, it's hence that sometimes when you get into talking about philosophy and the long-term objective, you get into a lot of philosophical BS and things get very exaggerated. But today I really want to talk in a rational sense and really talk about why this is going to become something so big and very impactful over the next, say, five to ten years. That's my general time frame. I really see this going mainstream. So outside of all the noise, let's really talk about what we're dealing with here with cryptocurrencies and blockchain. I have a lot of people asking me uh, common questions that go along the lines of, you know, Nick, where is blockchain? Where is cryptocurrencies going in the long term? Uh, there's a lot of noise in the space right now. It's pretty obvious. Where does this actually stand in the world? Well, there's a lot of real-time applications. I, I would actually be a little conservative and say that it's relatively limited, but the size and impact of some of these industries are massive. I think the biggest application is still going to be money, as we've seen with Bitcoin serving as peer-to-peer uh, -peer digital currency, as well as different uh, applications for industrial application or enterprise level applications such as uh, supply chain logistics. You have decentralized cloud storage, decentralized web hosting, uh, all kinds of stuff, You know, insurance policies, all these really interesting things that you could not only put onto uh, a blockchain platform, but along with that as well, utilize smart contracts for things like escrow, etc. So there are a lot of actual serious use cases here for blockchain technology, and I think people are starting to warm up to it. But I want to spend some time to talk about the broader perspective on what we're really dealing with here. And I'll also key in a few points that I've gotten from a presentation, a few presentations that I've seen as I've gotten to go to different conferences. So the first thing I want to talk about is the market we're dealing with here. We always talk about this as a market right now because there's a lot of, to be fair, a lot of investment and trading opportunities across the board. Well, what we're really dealing with, though, is not something that in the future will be uh, really known for trading, in a sense. It, it's actually going to be used, obviously, with what we hope it would all, we, we would all hope it would be used for in the future, and that is a payment solutions market or a means of exchanging value of some sort. So whether that be for peer-to-peer -peer digital currency or for business application, for utility, or it might be, for example, in the case of securities tokens, ownership in something. We are dealing with practically, at its core, a new revolutionary currency market. Now, to really put things into scale here, I've mentioned this before on the channel, but I really want to reiterate how big currency markets are in the world right now. So excluding cryptocurrencies, which seem like they've grown uh, to an exponential level, and they have, where, whereas we think cryptocurrencies with a valuation right now, I think at the video we're recording right now, it's at 400 30 $440 billion right now as we talk about it here in uh, 2018. At this moment, cryptocurrency seems so big, but in traditional currency markets, there's different estimates you'll get. But a number that I always stick to that seems to have the most backing behind it is generally around 84 trillion US dollars. If you take all of the fiat currency in the world, if you take the US dollar, uh, the euro, the Japanese yen, the Chinese yuan, you have all of these currencies mixed together. If you evaluate it in US dollars, it's around 84 trillion US dollars. Sometimes you'll get bigger figures than that. I would say it's probably a conservative number in regards to currencies. So because of this, we realize that we have this massive currency market. And for those who know about what this currency really is, we realize on the surface level that it's worthless pieces of paper or numbers in a database of some central bank or commercial bank that is literally just backed by governments as a means of trust. We have consensus to a degree in our countries across the world or on a global basis that these currencies hold some means of value because people are continuously trading value for it. It's just like cryptocurrencies in a sense. Uh, there is a means of value given it to it because markets give it that value. Someone's trading for it at that given moment or the last uh, value trade for that uh, different type of currency. So because of this, 
we have a massive, massive market that really isn't backed by anything, that doesn't have much utility, and doesn't really serve as a great way to do global transfers. We're becoming a very global society, uh, especially we have been over the past few years, and we're going to continue going down this trend. And with that, you need a currency system, a means of value exchange that works effectively on a global stage. But in a world, for example, in the case of remittance payments or global wire transfers of money where trillions of dollars are moving on a daily basis, you are left with systems like Western Union and all these traditional banking systems that take days, weeks, in some cases months, to make money transfers. And in many cases, they can get rejected. You can be censored out of doing business in other countries. And in a lot of cases, they're not transparent and leads to inefficiencies. Along with that as well, it's in a centralized system. We have to trust in these centralized institutions. As you all know, I don't like banks. Uh, I, I've made that pretty clear over some time. I, I think they served a purpose for a while, but the banking mechanisms have uh, left not only America, but of a wide variety of countries, many developing or, or in a third world status financially, where they've been left behind because of this system. They've been abused, they've been misused in this system. And I think that it's time we have a revolution. And I think we're gonna find that in a 430 something billion dollar cryptocurrency market because we have to realize the stark differences between what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with a traditional system that has no serious utility, that has terrible cross-border payments uh, or mechanisms for cross-border payments and is just trusted by central authorities who can print as much as they want of that currency and manage monetary policy on the lending practices of those specific currencies. Whereas we have a cryptocurrency market that is a new emerging market that's only valued at $430 billion that has utility, easy cross-border payments, uh, immutability on the ledger so long as it has a nice form of consensus like Bitcoin's uh, proof of work. You have... Um, in the case of protocols, entire protocol platforms that have coins that are the means of exchange of value uh, that will go about processing functions, uh, for example, with Ethereum as gas for the network to process all types of computational functions on a world basis computer. Now, again, we're on the early stages of this, but we can already start to see that there's so much value sets here, not only as currency, but entire industries which can build tokens or build protocols that will serve all of these enterprise functions, turn entire industries into decentralized industries industries that don't have central authoritators, that have a lack of uh, the need for trust. So this is very, very valuable, especially in the space of money. So if we're, if we're you know, even conservative here, let's say that it were to take the value of half of traditional currency markets, that's $42 trillion. Folks, we're sitting right now in the mid $400 billion range. That is multiple times over. That's an over 100-fold increase alone. So I think that it's very, very conservative to say that we're at, uh, you know, the late, I think to, to, to say, sorry, I would say that it, to say that we're on the later stages of this, that for example, what we saw in December and January was the final peak for cryptocurrencies. I think it's not only misleading, it's missing the bigger picture here, that we are seeing one of the biggest revolutions we've seen in financial history. It is one of the few evolutions of money uh, that we've seen over time. And it is fascinating to see that we're getting a whole new economy of not only technology, but along with that as well, a new means to uh, transact value. And speaking on that means of transacting value, this is something I want to uh, definitely, I won't take credit for. I got to give all credit due to Brock Pierce, who's been obviously a very influential individual in the space for cryptocurrencies for quite some time. He's been involved in digital currency uh, crazes back in the ages of World of Warcraft and uh, all types of online games before Bitcoin. And then he got in the space of cryptocurrencies very early on. But what Brock brought up uh, in a speech that he did also at the Futurama conference in uh, Dubai that I went to as well as here in uh, Cebu in the Philippines at the Beach Blockchain Conference is this idea of uh, a token-based economy. And uh, along with that, to kind of put it in perspective, the idea of, for example, what if we lived in a world where you owned Apple shares and you, in order to pay for products, you had to use Apple shares? It's this whole idea that tokens are bringing about and this idea of tokenizing ownership or purchasing power in some type of system, whether it be utility or security. The whole idea is that we're going to, over the next few years, I know it seems very odd and it's something that you have to think about in a forward perspective, we are going to most likely live in an economy where there are a variety of different tokens and currencies that we use as a means of value exchange. If you think about that, that's what dollars are at the end of the day. That's what reward points are at the end of the day. You know, you have these different means of exchange between two parties, and it's a way that we 
communicate as humans cross border cross culture you know cross religion no matter what money speaks it has value to it uh, and because we grant value to it it's a, a means of consensus and language between one one another for exchange and it's a very very beautiful system but we're not going to have the world of government-backed currencies. We're going to have a world where these tokens that are utility or security tokens, they serve different means of purchasing power, of enforcement, of community engagement, uh, of status in a sense. And it's really going to be interesting to see where that, that goes over the next few years. And the example he brought up, kind of going back to the point, was that in the future, if you wanted to, say, buy Apple products, you'd have to uh, purchase their tokens. Now, this, of course, will all happen most likely in the background. Uh, it won't be something where you have to manually go out to an exchange and uh, <coughs> go out and actually purchase the token. That would be quite monotonous and tedious. It's all going to most likely happen in the background. But for those who support communities early on, they'll want stake in tokens in these economies and for these different companies. Let's say, for example, Apple tokens. And when you have that stake, kind of like a shareholder, for example, you finally get this line of incentives together because you want the entire ecosystem itself to thrive. You want to see people enjoy Apple products. You want to get the word out. You want to do everything in your power, almost like an employee who's hired under the company out of free will to go support these projects. And this is another point he brought up as well that really, really opened my mind. And I can see this, the uh, symptoms of it across the board here, especially when I was working, as many of you know, out in Silicon Valley. And that is how we're going into a much more open source society. So you guys know when we look at projects, we always check the GitHub um, or the online framework where they have all of the open source code for projects, not only to see if they have a functioning project, but to see the actual functioning tech that they have granted to the public to critique to edit, to add updates to, whatever it may be. And the reason this is very, very powerful, why we're seeing this shift uh, from uh, closed source technology, for example, think uh, the code or work of Google or some big company like Facebook or Apple, and transitioning into a period where we all contribute to some degree, we at least have the opportunity to contribute to open source code. The reason why this is very big is because with this token economy and this whole new ecosystem of uh, open source technology, there's an incentive structure. We all have an opportunity to contribute to it and the benefits that come from contributing to open source technology, and we can see it in the ICO market obviously, is becoming higher than that of the closed source one. I remember probably a year or two ago, I had people who were avidly um, trying to work for Facebook or Google. It was the standard. You wanted to work for a big name company. You want to get in there. The financial incentives are there, but also you, you were there with the big players. You know, you were doing all the innovative stuff. But now I can tell you guys, over the past few months, even since I started my channel, when I was working back in Silicon Valley, still running my channel, I started to see the shift in uh, trends from closed source to open source. And I started to see how, for example, if you were to pitch to an angel investor or a venture capitalist, someone tied to a venture capital fund, and you were trying to pitch an early stage startup, they kind of, and not to be rude, they kind of laughed at you in a sense. They're, they still do it nowadays, and it's becoming more and more common because the means uh, of... Uh, Value exchange is changing and where the value is found. It's not being found in the Facebooks and the Googles of today. It is going to be found in the upcoming platforms and ecosystems that are coming in this whole blockchain and cryptocurrency community. It is going to be in a much more decentralized and trustless manner where there isn't central authoritators. It's a community that contributes to these great ideas and the incentive structures are pushing for it. They get it in Silicon Valley. They get it in New York City in the financial district. They realize that it's changing the game. It's not here yet entirely it's not on the you know on the surface level we get the concept it's going to hit eventually uh, but the whole thing about it is that with this new system in place there is no way to fight it it is going to be a massive massive revolution in the way we think people are incentivized to do things not just financially but becoming a part of something that you can relate to and, uh, and contribute to to some degree so I know I've ranted and raved on here a little bit, guys, but just to put a little bit of perspective on what we're really dealing with here, this is a massive revolution. Again, it takes time for technology and new trends to really emerge. We can see that something's coming. It's very similar to, say, the dot-com era, where we all knew, for example, the internet was going to change uh, the way we think about the world and how we interact as humans. But 
with blockchain and tokenization, you're really going to see an emergence of new ecosystems, new means of value exchange between participants, and a new system that encourages active participation in the things that you believe in, the things that you love, whether that be a company, whether it be an organization, whether it be uh, you know a dApp that you like, whatever it may be. We're about to see one of the biggest transformations in technology that we've ever seen in the history of humanity. And I think because of that, I'm proud to be a part of it. I'm proud that you guys are here, and I want to make sure that you feel that you're early to this, guys. Period. You really are. And it's so great to know that we're all early adopters in this space and that even though it seems like things are crazy now and it seems like things have expanded to a high degree, that we're just getting started in this revolution. So to that, I you know, applaud to the idea that we're going towards a more decentralized future, a future that brings about the power and uh, brings back both the value and purchasing power to the average everyday man and woman. And with that, I say thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you guys in five to 10 years and let's see where we can take this space. All right, guys, take care, trade smart, invest safe, and I'll see you all in the next video. Stay tuned.